Did you enjoy that? Do you feel <clears throat> Do you feel a little younger this morning than when you came in? I hope that we do. And I hope that we are reminded of how important the future generation of our children are. They are the church. And we are so very blessed and thankful to have them. And we look forward to having more and more of them. Now, I know Sister Jill is already downstairs and we've had this discussion. But I do want to say, uh, church, be sure all of the teachers, all of the ladies who served yesterday and took care of and watched babies. And I'm not uh, going to attempt to try to name everyone because we would miss names. Um, but Sister Jill has done an excellent job of handling and, and heading up our Bible school program so as you get around, be sure and thank everyone who participated. Uh, I'm going to name a couple of behind-the-scenes people, and I know they don't want me to, but uh, Jill commandeered, she voluntold Brother Rick and Sister Ramona that they were going to do a lot of work on a lot of things. And a lot of what you see on the stage this morning is a result of their creativity and their efforts. And as you can tell, this did not happen overnight. Okay, so I just want to be sure that you understand that uh, there's been a lot of effort that went into this. Uh, this was not a prepackaged Bible school. Just go buy it and everything comes with it and set it up. Uh, there's been a lot of effort. Teachers that decorated their classes, if you uh, had gotten around to see, if you went downstairs, Brother Scott's class looked completely different yesterday than it did this morning. We started to leave a bunch of it up and just leave it up for the class. But anyway, um, all of those things, all the teachers, everybody volunteered, they pitched in, they dug into their own pockets and things, and it was a, a fantastic day, and we just praise God for it. And it's uh, such a blessing to be able to minister to our kids. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed them. I got to sit down on the front of the stage with them and do some lessons with them yesterday. And their energy, I told them, I said, now don't raise your hand unless you know the question. Well, some of them raised their hand every time I asked a question. They, they were excited. They, they weren't sure what the answer was, but I'm excited and I want to participate. And you know, that's the way we ought to be as Christians. We ought to be excited. If there's a place and an opportunity to serve in God's house, in God's family, we ought to be excited and we ought to want to get our hand in the air and say, Lord, I'll pitch in, I'll be there, and I'll be glad to help. And so uh, I would encourage you in that. Before we get into our message this morning, if you would, bow with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we thank you, Father, for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, as we come now to a time that we share your word, God, truly, that's what it is. It is your word. I pray, dear God, that for every person here that we will take the time right now to, under your guidance and under your power, Lord, that we would put aside thoughts of yesterday and tomorrow or anything else that's going on around us and lord right now we would each and every one as individuals we would hear from you god that our focus and attention will be upon you this morning and what you would speak into our hearts we pray today dear god that you will touch the lives of every person here and god if there is anyone here that does not know you as their savior lord that they have not yet come to a saving faith that they don't understand and know your love in their hearts yet that today before this day is over, God, you would draw them and that they would humble themselves and come to you and receive you as their Savior. Lord, that today could be their birthday, the day that they began new life in you, the day that eternity in heaven begins with you. So God, would you touch us today? Would you touch each and every one? Give us all understanding according to your Holy Spirit today. And may you be honored and glorified in this service. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Savior and Lord. Amen. Would anyone just like to take a guess about what we have to speak about this morning? Y'all are all clueless. Whole ocean seen up here in front of us and nobody knows what we're going to talk about today. Get your Bibles out this morning and turn with me to the book of Jonah. <laughs> While you're turning to the book of Jonah, several years ago, whenever I had just started preaching uh, at the first church that I pastored, we had a uh, <clears throat> uh, little drive for attendance and encouraged people to get others to come. 
And I gave them a challenge, and they were a little bit smaller church. I said, if you can, on such and such Sunday, if you can reach 100 people, there was a big tree across the street, had a great big wide limb on it, just, uh, oh, about eight or nine feet up off the ground. And I said, if you'll get 100 people, then we'll take chairs, and we'll go sit in the street, and I'll climb up in that tree, and I'll preach to you out of the tree. Well, they liked just three or four people having that hundred that Sunday, but I told them I was game. So after we sang, we went out and we blocked off the street with a couple of cars, and it's a small town, so you could do that. Blocked off a couple of, and I backed my truck under the tree and set a ladder up and climbed up on that limb. And you know what I preached to them about? Zacchaeus. There you go. Now you're catching on. All right. Now, today is, we're going we're gonna to be looking in the book of Jonah this morning, but here's what we're going to understand today. We're going to find out where grace meets judgment, where grace and judgment meet. And that's the title for our message today, is where grace and judgment meet. You know, there's some very important lessons to be learned in the book of Jonah, there is a lot of things, and we probably will not cover all of them today, but we are going to take you through uh, some of the verses in each chapter of the book of Jonah, and we're going to cover uh, Jonah from this perspective where grace and judgment meet. And so this morning, we're going to begin in verse 1. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar, the city of Nineveh, number one, was a large city. The Bible tells us that, and we'll be reading that in some of these verses. Nineveh was a very large city. Nineveh was a city of Assyria. Nineveh was not one of the cities in Israel that God was particularly concerned about, but they were outside of the realm of those that God generally would have uh, had uh, a general compassion on. Uh, he was focused on his people and their well-being, and Nineveh was known as an evil land, and Nineveh was known as an especially violent enemy. And so whenever they would come against you, there was a lot of extreme violence that took place. And so God sends a message, and God has a messenger. And I'll, let us hear from the word of the Lord this morning. We're going to begin in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now let me tell you, we're going to skip past some of the verses. I'm not going to read all four chapters in their entirety. We're going to go pick out some particular verses, and in the meantime, I will quickly fill you in on some commentary. So, in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, First and foremost, we find very openly in this chapter that it is God's word that came to Jonah. And here's what I have a question for you about. I spoke about this Thursday night. Have we put the emphasis on the Word of God for our lives that we ought to put on it? For our lives is the Word of God the authority for our lives. Do we base our decisions? Do we base our living? Do we base our words? Do we base our lives on the Word of God and what God has to say to us? So I ask you this morning for you to answer as individuals, what authority does God's Word hold in your individual life? Because it's very clear that God spoke. And notice how He spoke. God spoke individually, specifically to Jonah. Now, it's a fine thing to come in and sit and listen to a sermon with a gathering of other people. But when we come into God's house and we are in a gathering of other people and the only concern that we have is what God is saying to somebody else instead of what God is saying specifically and intentionally to us, then we are losing the message of God's Word. God spoke directly to a man by the name of Jonah. Now, we don't know that much about Jonah other than what we find here in this story. He's the son of a man by the name of Amittai. But God had an individual word for Jonah. God has an individual word for every single one of you today. But we have to be listening, and we have to be prepared, and we have to be obedient and willing hearers of the word of God. And so we know that Jonah heard the word of God. In verse 2, God spoke and said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. 
Go out to that great city. Now, one of the things that you notice is, is the first thing that God gives is a command. Arise and go. Arise and go to that city. Go to them. Too many times we're sitting back as churches today and we are sitting here and we're saying, y'all come to us. When in reality, we need to be going to the world. We need to pray to God as individuals, Lord, who would you have me to go to? Who is it that you would have me to speak to? Who is it that I can impact their lives with your word and with the love of Jesus Christ? And one of the things that happened is that God told him to go to Nineveh, that great city, and to cry out against it. So we find there was a reason he was to go cry out against. You know, church, one of our problems today is that the church, we as Christians, as individuals, have stopped crying out against sin. We have stopped standing against sin. We have okayed sin. In many terms, we find today that people who are professing to be Christians are playing footsie under the table with sin. We want to figure out how we can go just as far as we can go in sin and still be okay with God. You don't find that in God's Word. That's not what God's Word is about. That's not what God's people did. That's not what salvation is about. Salvation is about being a new creature in Christ and coming out from among them and being separate, says the Lord your God. And so Jonah was to go down to Nineveh and he was to cry out. And I want to tell you, there was something uh, that said there... Uh, <clears throat> in, that, uh, in that verse about going that we need to pay attention to, that that word go also corresponds with Christ's words to us whenever he said, go ye therefore in the Great Commission. Go ye therefore. And then the next thing, if you go down where I have it underlined here, in verse 3, what happened? Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here, Jonah is supposed to be standing up against sin and crying out and going to Nineveh. And what does he do? He goes somewhere else. You know, one of our problems today in the church is whenever it comes time to cry out against sin, is we're crying out against the sin of somebody else, but we're figuring out how it's okay for us. I heard a preacher preaching the other day, and he's dead on. This is the attitude that the church has. This is the attitude that the world has. Why are we in the shape we're in today? Because we've stopped preaching about sin. We've stopped talking about sin. We've stopped naming sin, but whenever something new and big comes along, then all of a sudden we get up in arms about it. So we've got all the issues going on today and, and with all of the sexual uh, immorality that's going on. And so what do we do? We pick the latest, greatest things. We pick on this and we pick on that. And we pick on these other things. And rightly so, they are against the Word of God. They have been. They always have been. They are and they always will be against the Word of God. God has never condoned sexual immorality in any way, shape, or form. But what we've done down through the years in the church is we've let down on fornication Sex outside of the marriage, we've let down on adultery, we've ducked our eyes because, boy, that hit home. I know somebody, that's in my family, that's this, that's that. But then something else comes along, a new thing comes along, some other thing comes along. We get into the homosexuality and the transgender and all the issues that we're facing today. And what do we do? We stand up and get up in arms about those things. So what are you if you're against that? You're homophobic, preacher. You're homophobic. You're against uh, this and against... No, I'm not. God's Word is. And I am against whatever God's Word says that we ought to be against. But you let a preacher stand up and preach about fornication or adultery, well, you're just old-timey. That's, that's just old. Why? Because we've kind of grown to accept that. We're letting that go. We don't want people to do anything big, but we don't mind a little white lie every now and then. We don't want to go out and, and embezzle millions of dollars, but a little theft here and there, a little white collar theft, go into the restaurant and wipe out the whole napkin holder so you can fill up your car glove box with napkins. We don't think about that. Oh, everybody's laughing. What's that mean? All of a sudden, God just got in our business, didn't he? Huh? Huh? You go by the store. Oh, yeah, be sure and tell them, uh, be sure and grab plenty of ketchup because we're out at home. So now at home, you got a drawer. Everybody's got one of those drawers, don't you? Where you put all the extra stuff. 
Everybody's got a drawer. All the leftover uh, forks that you picked up out of the restaurant, you know, the, got a handful of them, took them home. I don't have to wash those. I can eat with them and throw them away. I don't have to buy ketchup. I can squeeze a bunch of packets and I've got my ketchup, got my ketchup fixed for the day. See, we don't talk about those sorts of things. The sin of Nineveh came up to God. He said in verse 2, I want you to know something, folks. The wickedness of our land comes up to God. But it's not just the overall corporate w wickedness of our land, but God knows about the wickedness of my heart. God knows about my thoughts. God knows about my intents. God knows about your thoughts, and God knows about your intents. God knows when you're mumbling under your, under your breath about somebody. God knows when you're sharing in love. You know what sharing in love is, don't you? That's the G word in the Bible called gossip. Okay? God knows about those things. The wickedness of Nineveh came up. The wickedness of America is coming up before God. The wickedness of us as individuals comes up before God. If we're not walking for the Lord the way that we ought to be walking for the Lord, you're not hiding anything from God. You may hide it from somebody, but you're not hiding it from God. I'm going to tell you a real quick little story. <clears throat> Years ago, when we were down, when Dad was pastoring down at Vincent, many of you will remember Brother Harvey and Sister Betty Noyes. Brother Harvey came to church one time, and he had this neat little trick. Just as neat as it could be. You know, I was probably seven, eight years old. And Brother Harvey had this little trick. And it was a little box. And I didn't, understand, I didn't understand at the time how it worked. But he held out his hand. He said, watch this. And he had, uh, I thought it was a penny. He had a penny in his hand. And he said, now watch my magic box. And he put the magic box over the penny. And whenever he picked it up, there was a dime in his hand. Now, when you're about seven or eight years old, that just really is intriguing. You know, and man, wow, looky there. So after a little, he did it two or three times. And then finally, he showed me what the trick was. The little penny was just a cover over the dime. And, so, and it was magnetized so it would pick up. And so whenever you picked that box up, you had a dime. You just use any old dime, but you had to have that little penny cover. And so I don't remember if I asked to borrow it or wanted to take it to school and show it to some of my friends. And Brother Harvey said, yes, that's no problem. And so I took it home. Well, I was practicing with it. Well, that little penny cover, my hands at that time weren't deft enough to understand to keep that, and I would mess around, and that penny cover would come off. And so I thought, well, if I take a piece of paper and I put the dime in, that'll help hold it. And I got the dime stuck in the penny holder. Now, that's not, that's not that big of a deal, right? But I got scared. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. So do you know what I did? I hid the little magic trick. And of all places, do you know where I hid it? You know your couch has got that lining stuff up underneath it? <laughs> I used to lay on the floor and watch TV, and for whatever reason, as a kid, I'd reach up underneath there, I'd pick at that, and I got a hole in that. And so I figured out the best place to hide this where nobody's going to find it is up in that hole in that lining under the couch. And it stayed there for a long time until somebody moved the couch and it fell out. And what's this? And all of a sudden, what I thought was hidden was brought to light. And I had to answer to mom and dad, and I, I don't remember for sure, but I very likely may have had to go back and take that back to Brother Harvey and apologize. And you know all it took to get the penny cover off of the dime was to take the sharp tip of a pocket knife and just flip the penny out and get that piece of paper out, and everything was just the way it had been. But I hid, I hid what I had done as people today we think God doesn't know but our wickedness comes up before God and the wickedness of Nineveh 
had come up before God. Folks, don't think that you can hide anything from God. There's nothing. If there's a sin you're struggling with, find an accountability partner. Listen, we're talking about grace today. We need to learn about the grace of God. We need to learn that as Brother Dale Rogers spoke at the revival last night as he was speaking on the parable of, the, of the, what we call the prodigal son, but the parable of the loving father, that our father in heaven is waiting for us. He's watching for us to come to him. We don't have to hide our sin because our God is full of love and our God is full of abundant grace. We don't have to continue to carry wickedness because that will lead to judgment. But God's grace, when God's grace meets judgment and we begin to understand that I can receive God's grace and he will give it to me freely and he will give it to me abundantly, then I can stop hiding but see, Jonah didn't understand that at this point. See, Jonah needed God's grace. We, we look at the story of Jonah. We look at the story of Nineveh and a historical city that actually was. And we look at Jonah, a man who actually lived. A man who was called by God to go and share a message. And it was, it was, it was a message of judgment. But God's grace collided with that judgment that God was going to bring when the people came to humble repentance before God. But see, Jonah doesn't do that. Jonah arose, and he thought he could run from God. And so he fled, trying to go to Tarshish. In verse 3 there, it says, he went down <clears throat> to Joppa. I want to tell you something. When you're running from God, there's only one way to go, and you're not going up. When you're running from God, you're going down. I know that that just has to do with a, uh, a location on a map. And we, you know, we use those terms. We, I went down, you know, from here. We go down to Piletown. We go down to Poe. We go down to Bernie. We go down to Malden. And we go up to Bloomfield, right? Okay? But I think sometimes in God's Word, there's some specific meaning behind some of these things. And I want you to know when you're running from God, you're not going up. You're going down a pathway that you don't need to go down and so he went down to Joppa he found a ship going somewhere else anywhere out of the presence of God folks I want you to know you can't outrun God because Satan will provide a way and Satan doesn't want you to do God's work he'll provide a way but you can't run where God can't find you you know Jonah was trying to do the exact same thing that happened in Genesis chapter 3 after Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit, their eyes were open. They realized their nakedness. What did they do? They hid from God. That's all Jonah was trying to do is Jonah was trying to hide from God. Jonah had built up a hate. See, God sent him with a message, and it was a message of judgment. But Jonah didn't even want them to hear a message of judgment. Jonah did not want them to have a chance. Jonah didn't want them to have an opportunity. And you know what, Christians? When we fail to witness to people, when we fail to share the goodness of the love of Christ with people, in essence, we're saying, I'm not that concerned about your souls. And I know that's strong and that's harsh and, and it hits me. It, it has hit me before it ever hits any of you all. I've got to deal with that in my life. I've got to remember that in my own walk with Jesus, that when I fail to be a witness, that somewhere there, there's a lack for the souls of that person that I'm with. And not only that, if you look there in verse 3, but it says that he paid a fare. He paid a fare to go to Tarshish. You're going to pay something when you're in sin. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. So as Jonah was running from God, it cost him. But I want you to go down now. Let's go on down. He gets in the ship. He gets ready to go to Tarshish. He's on the ship. The, the, the wind begins to build up. God sends a storm and the waves are rocking and the boat is sloshing back and forth. And these guys that were running the boat, who owned the boat, these seamen, they were scared. But look at the last half of verse 5. Where do we find Jonah? Chapter 1, verse 5b. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. Jonah's down the bottom of the boat. 
Folks, I want you to know something. You look around today and you don't have to look very long and you don't have to look very far to see how brazen people are in their sins. Why? Because sin stupefies. When we are not aware of, when we are not willing to receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit by the Word of God for the sin that's in our life, then we begin to be callous. The Bible speaks about our conscience being seared over as a hot iron. Jonah was so calloused against Nineveh, he was so calloused against the Word of God, he was so calloused about what God had called him to do that he didn't even have a concern about it. He, didn't, he wasn't concerned about the fact that he was running from God. He went down into the lowest part of the boat and he went to sleep. Now I want you to know there's another part, there's another story in the Bible that tells us about somebody going into the boat and going to sleep and that was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there was a similar storm that was about to break the boat up while he was there with the disciples and the disciples came to him and said, Lord, wake up. Do you, do you not care that we perish? But I want you to know Jesus wasn't sleeping because he was stupefied. He wasn't sleeping because he was calloused over because of sin. He was sleeping because he was at rest in the hands of the Father. And he knew who controlled the storm. And he got up and he said, peace be still. And the winds and the waves ceased and calmed. Jonah didn't have, Jonah had the ability for that storm to pass. But Jonah didn't use that ability. The first thing he did is he went and he lay down and he went to sleep. How many people today are unaware of God touching and moving in their life and they're asleep in their sin? We rely on all sorts of things. Carnal security, our own smugness. We rely on people, we rely on money, we rely on our government. We've stopped responding to God. We stopped hearing what God has to say. We've stopped hearing the word of the Lord. We've stopped carrying the word of the Lord. We have gone about hiding our own sin and we're so convinced in that and so uh, involved in that. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says, Beware, brethren. Here's a warning. He's speaking to the Christians. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will harden your heart. And I want you to know he emphasizes while it is called today. There's no place in the scripture. I've heard people say, I'll get right with God one of these days. I'll get my life right with God when I retire. I'll get, I've even heard people say, I'll get right with God on my deathbed. You're not guaranteed that opportunity. And you don't know that your death is going to linger long enough for you to be able to get right with God. The Bible says that there's a time and that, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is when we get it right. Now is when we step up and when we answer for those things. If I'd have taken that little magic box and if I'd have gone to my dad and I'd have said, Dad, I, I, I borrowed this from Brother Harvey and I need help because I've got it stuck. What can you do to help me? My dad would have taken care of it. But I didn't do that, and I hid it, and then there was a consequence. There was embarrassment for me because I was found out. He says, beware, brethren. Beware of what? The same thing that Jonah did departing from the living God. What is our command? Exhort one another. Encourage one another daily. Christians, if there's one thing we ought to do is we ought to quit fussing and fighting with one another over a bunch of little petty stuff and we ought to start to lift up one another. We ought to start encouraging one another. We ought to be trustworthy so that when somebody's in a need or if I have a need, I can go to you or if you have a need, you can come to me and we can exhort one another and encourage one another in our walk with Jesus Christ. The sea continues to go on and builds and we have all of these events that take place. In verse 12, they said, what shall we do? He, he admitted, he said, I'm the problem. I'm the reason God is after me. I'm running for God and this is why the sea is in the shape that it's in. And so in verse 12, or verse 11, they ask him, what shall we do to you? And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. 
Notice what he said. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. With, a, with waves that big and winds that boisterous, what, would, what was Jonah assuming the end of his life would be? Or what was he assuming the end of being thrown overboard would be? Death. Do you know what Jonah just said? Jonah said, I'd rather die than be obedient to God. In essence, that's what he said. Because you know Jonah had another route. Do you know that there was another option that would have been probably just as effective at calming the sea as Jesus going out onto the side of that boat and saying, peace be still? And that would have been if Jonah had said to those men in that boat, turn this boat around and take me back. I've got a job to do and I'm going to go to Nineveh and proclaim the word of God. But instead of being humble and repentant, instead of and, uh, admitting his faults before God, instead of uh, surrendering the hatred that was in his heart for Nineveh and the fear of going and being a spokesperson for God, Jonah said, I'd rather die than be obedient to God. Just throw me overboard. And he thought that was going to be the end of it. He thought that was the end of the line and that that would take care of. But he never said, take me back, that I might serve God obediently. Folks, I want you to know today God is waiting for us to come back and serve him obediently if, we're, if you find yourself outside the will of God today. He's just like that father in the story of the prodigal son. He's watching and he's waiting and he is ready to receive us, to restore us and to bring us back in to the household. And there's some very telling information in verse 13. Nevertheless, those men did not want to throw Jonah overboard. They did not want to be responsible for this man's death. They didn't want to know that they, they knew that this would be the end of his life. As far as they knew and understood, and these were not godly men. But these men tried their best to keep from having to throw Jonah. It says they rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them folks i want you to know today that there's a lot of people out there and they are rowing hard for salvation they're putting their best into it they're giving it their best effort i got i'm trying to please god and i'm trying to please god and i'm trying to please god i put money in the offering plate i do this i do that and i do something else to please god i want you to know all the rowing all the doing all the giving and all of those things without a personal relationship with jesus christ is nothing, and you will still spend eternity in the devil's hell. We haven't been called to do. We do because we're called. But the first thing that we've been called to is we've been called to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jonah wanted to reject God, and as a result, others were, were, were suffering. Do you know that sometimes others are going to suffer because of your disobedience? Parents are disobedient to God, and guess what? Those babies in that house hear and see the dissension and the discord of what's going on in that home. Parents are disobedient, and the children are seeing the things that their parents are doing. And the parents will honestly tell you, I've had parents before, this is the way I live my life, but I don't want my children to be that way. I've heard people say, I want my children to be raised in church. Well, guess what? Get up, get your clothes on, and take them to church, and sit in the pew with them, and open the Bible, and show them that you have an interest in God. Humble yourself before God, and give yourself entirely to the Lord, and it'll make a difference in your children's life. But if you keep going out here and living like the world and expecting your children to change and to be something different and to, to, to be able to spend eternity in heaven and you're living like the devil in front of them, I want you to know they've got two strikes against them and there's a fastball coming down the middle. It's not impossible. But you're stacking the deck against them. Our efforts alone are not good enough to outmaneuver God. We cannot get out of sin by our own means. Your change of morality, well, preacher, I used to be this terrible drug addict, and I went to a treatment program, and I made up my mind, and I'm not doing that anymore. Praise God for that. 
But did you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ? And if not, then all you've done is made a moral decision. These men rode hard trying to overcome the storm, but they could not overcome the storm that day. Moving on down to verse 17. It's time to throw him over. No, nothing to do but just throw him over. So they pick Jonah up and they throw him overboard. And the last thing uh, that happened is in verse 15, it says the sea stopped its raging and it became peaceful. And those men feared God. All of a sudden, they weren't worshipers of God before, but all of a sudden they began to worship God. But I want you to, say, I want you to know something. Verse 17, everybody thinks we know what verse 17 is. Okay, we got him right here with us today. You got to use the props while we have them today, all right? Put that dude right up there. What happens next in this story? The big fish. Sometimes referred to as the whale. The Bible refers to it as a big fish, whatever kind it was. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. I'm going to tell you today that the physical part, the physical thing that God sent to swallow Jonah is a great fish, whatever kind it happened to be. But I'm going to tell you what Jonah got swallowed by that day. Jonah got swallowed by the grace of God. Because in the midst of his obstinate disobedience, his very forward disobedience against God, God still provided grace for Jonah. And God sent a great fish. And as long as God was in control of that fish, then Jonah was safe, even though he was in a nasty condition. Can you all imagine that? Can you just imagine for a moment what that might have been like? There's a lot of speculation about what that, and I'm not going to get into it because the scripture doesn't specifically speak to it, just simply says. But I want you to know today that in spite of his disobedience and his attitude, Jonah was swallowed up by God's grace. Folks, I want you to know today that there are some of you that have had some close calls in life. You've done some things. You've shook your fist at God. You've waved your little finger under God's nose. You've been obstinate. You've been disobedient. You've disobeyed what you knew to be the word of God. You haven't gone when God said go. You've hid from God. You've run from God. And the wickedness and evil of our life has come up before God. And yet we've been swallowed by the grace of God. God has blessed us with blessings today. Innumerable, innumerable blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And it's because we've been swallowed up by the grace of God. Folks, I want to tell you something. We better be thankful for that grace of God. So Jonah's in the belly of the fish, and he spends three days and three nights. And there's more that we can talk about there, but we're going to move on to chapter 2. We're going to move down to chapter 2, verse 7. He's in the belly of the fish. What do you suppose he does? He finally decides, I better start praying about this. Look at verse 7. Of Jonah chapter 2. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. When did he say that he realized he needed God? When his soul fainted in him. When he was at the bottom of the ladder. Why is it that we wait and we do everything else under the sun? We'll row hard. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll change these things in our lives. But we won't call upon God until we're flat of our back looking up. And there's no, no other place to look. And then we'll look up and we'll call out to God. And when my soul fainted within me. When I could do nothing else. God, when you had completely engulfed me with your grace. And I had no other thing to look at but to look into your face. Then Jonah called out to God. Folks, I hope today that you're not waiting to your lowest point to call out to God. Because I'm going to tell you something. I've done it. And I'll bet a lot of you have done, I dare say probably everybody has done it at some point. We've called out to God, we've made promises to God on our sick bed, and when we were in a financial difficulty, when our family was falling apart, when this was happening and that was happening, we've made those things for God, and what we do as soon as everything got better in our life, were, were, were we still following through with those things? Probably not. We're coming up on the 20th 
second anniversary next month of September the 11th. The first two weeks, the first few days after, people begging churches, open up, oh, have a, let's have a service. All of a sudden, people had an interest in being in church. All of a sudden, churches declared our doors are going to be open. We're going to have a prayer service. And people flocked in, and people flocked in. And how long did that last? That lasted for about two weeks till we figured out that we're no longer under attack. Then where are we? Then where's our commitment to God? Then where is our decision to serve God? So, see, we find Jonah here kind of in a, in a bind, you might say. Jonah makes some decisions and he makes some prayers to God. And God caused the fish to vomit him out onto the ground. And we'll move on to chapter 3 and we'll see what he does. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Folks, I want you to know something. When God has a word that needs to go forth, God is not going to stop the proclamation of that word. God did not change the word. God still had a word. He had chosen a messenger. He had a message, and he had a messenger. Today, we need more messengers. The scripture talks about the fields being white unto harvest. Pray unto the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. There needs to be more messengers carrying the message of salvation, carrying the message of God's grace, carrying the message of obedience to God's word. And, and, and righteousness and sanctification in our life. We need to carry the word of God. Where are we and what are we doing? God came back to Jonah again and he had the same message. And God still has the same message for us today and it is to cry out against the wickedness of sin that it surrounds us. He said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. God still has that message. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 6, you'll read about Noah. God told Noah to build an ark, but do you know that in the time, the hundred years or more that it took for Noah to build that ark, that there was a message that was going forth. Every time his hammer drove a nail into the wood, every time they heard the pounding of the hammer and the nail going in, there was a message that was going forth. The Bible tells us that, that, that uh, uh, Noah was a proclaimer. Or he was a preacher of the word of God. He was preaching by his actions, and he was preaching that there's one way to get out of this flood, and the people turned off their ears. They didn't want to hear Folks, it's time we get our ears turned back on and we get back to hearing what thus says the Word of God. Abraham and the angels, when Sodom, again, and, and in the book of Noah, you'll find, and I, I was really contemplating whether to bring all these three stories together today, but in the book of Genesis, you have Noah, and then later in, in there you have Lot at Sodom, and how the wickedness of Sodom had come up to God. The wickedness of the earth had come up to God in Genesis chapter 6. Here, the wickedness of, of Nineveh has come up before God. Folks, I want you to be aware God is aware of the wickedness that's going on around us. We think, well, he's, he's just not going to do anything about it. It's okay now. We live in a new time, a new era, and God's changed his mind. No, God hasn't changed his mind. He's still aware, and he still has a message. Jonah carried a message. Jesus carried a message. The prophets carried a message, and there's two messages, folks. There's either a message of grace and salvation, or there's a message of judgment. Precious souls are going to spend eternity in one of two places. Rejecting God, spending it in eternity in hell, or receiving Christ as their Savior and spending it in heaven. Chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. See, the result of what happened in the fish's belly after the fish vomited him out was, okay, I'm going to go. Now, we'll find out how he went in just a little bit, but he said, okay, I'm going to go. And so he started, and after he had gone a day's journey, he started into the edge of Nineveh, and it took him three days to get across Nineveh, and he preached and he preached and he preached this message that God had given him, and that's found in verse 4. Uh, 
And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. How much grace is there in that message? Anybody hear any grace there? There is. There's one bit of grace. You got 40 days. There's 40 days. If you don't change your ways in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Church, I want you to know today there's a message of grace to be heard, and that's you got today. We all we think about how young we are. We saw the kids. I feel younger after yesterday than I have in a long time. I thoroughly enjoyed yesterday. I don't look any younger, though, do I, Wilson? <laughs> it, didn't change, it didn't change my hair back to any other colors, did it? I feel younger after being with those kids yesterday and enjoying their energy and their excitement and to see them again this morning and to see how excited they were to talk about letting their light shine for Jesus. But what about our light shining for Jesus? What are we doing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we enthused? Are, are we ready to go out and share the word? So we say, he goes out and he begins to share the message. Now let's look at verses 5 through 9. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Folks, these people responded in repentance. Not just, we're not just repenting for ourselves. We're repenting in case our animals did anything wrong. If we're going to sit in sackcloth and ashes, which was a sign of humility and mourning over uh, whatever it might have been. In this case, it was against their sin. They said, if we're going to mourn, our animals are going to mourn. If we're going to fast, the animals are going to fast. We're going to sit here and we're going to wait to hear from God because we don't even know if God's grace is enough. And God did not have an obligation because they were an Assyrian nation. But they went to the furthest extent that they could possibly go. And yes, this is Old Testament, so there were works involved. There was the taking off the robe, taking off the pride, and putting on the sackcloth, and sitting in sackcloth and ashes, and mourning over their sin, and proclaiming a fast, and all those things that they were doing was to say, God, we're humble before you. Today, we find that intercession through Jesus Christ. And that grace comes through Christ. But here, it was the proclamation of there's one way, and that's through repentance. And those people repented before God. They didn't have the parable of the prodigal son yet to understand the gracious father who saw his son coming afar off and ran and threw himself on his son and welcomed him home and put a ring on his finger and put a robe on him and put shoes on his feet and called out for the fatted calf to be killed. He didn't have that story. They didn't understand that. But they knew one thing. If there's one opportunity to get right with God, it's going to be to repent before God and that's what they did and I want you to look at what verse 10 says we've heard the message of judgment that Jonah had to go and proclaim we see what the response of the people was now let's find out what's the end game what's God do then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it Folks, I want you to know something today, that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient for us. God saw their works. He saw their humble repentance. That represented Jesus Christ. He relented, and he did not bring that judgment against them. Judgment met grace that day. Jonah's already met grace. Jonah's already understood some grace, but now we're going to move on. We find that the people of Nineveh have received grace from God, and God has relented and said, I'll not carry out that judgment, that punishment against them. Folks, there's one way to avoid, and it lies in your hands. Had the people of Nineveh stood up and shook their fist at God and said, will not bow, will not repent, God would have destroyed them. And they were a huge city. We'll talk about that momentarily. 
but they humbled themselves. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. What displeased Jonah exceedingly? That God provided grace. I have preached a, a sermon similar to this, but more focused on Jonah in the past. And the title of that was to beware of a Jonah attitude. See, sometimes in our lives, we don't want God's grace to fall on others. The scripture tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, but we love our neighbor as far as we want to love them. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. Boy, doesn't that sound like a bunch of professing Christians today? Doesn't that sound like a bunch of judgmentalism that shouldn't be in our lives? It displeased Jonah to the point that he got exceedingly angry. Verse 2, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Can you imagine for just a moment pointing your finger at God and saying, I told you so to God? That's exactly what Jonah did. He has run from God. He's been in the middle of a, a, a great torrential storm in the ocean, in the sea. He's been cast out, and God's grace swallowed him up for three days in the belly of a great fish. He has prayed. He went and got to see what very possibly may have been history's largest revival that has ever been known. And then turns around and gets mad because God extends grace. Church, I want you to know today, we better be careful of having a Jonah attitude. We better be careful. And it's not just a Jonah attitude. It was the attitude of the older brother of the prodigal son. Because whenever the prodigal son came home and dad received him, what happened to the older brother? He came home and he's mad. Well, you haven't done that for me before. I don't want anything to do with it. That's your son. That's not my brother. That's your son. We start making lines of differentiation about who can and cannot receive God's grace. And Jonah, in essence, what he was doing was pl blaming God's grace for his hard heart. It displeased Jonah. How much of God's grace displeases us? Well, as long as it's coming our way, we're not very displeased with it, are we? but let it go on to somebody else that we don't think deserves grace because they've offended us, then all of a sudden God's grace displeases us. What was the content? Notice what this says. Verse 2, so he prayed to the Lord. Now what do you think about whenever you're praying? You think about praying about important things and good things and so on and so on. And what does Jonah do? Jonah prays to God with an attitude, with, with an I told you so attitude, with discontent, with literally with hatred in his heart is what the content of his prayer was. He said, I told you that was what was going to happen when I was still in my country. And that's why I fled previously for Tarshish. For I know that you're a gracious and merciful. Folks, right there is the answer Jonah said, I know that you are a gracious, merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents from doing harm. But that's not what I wanted you to do, God. That's not the response that I wanted for these people. I wanted to see them destroyed. How many people can you think of in the circle of all the people that you know that you might have that attitude about? They don't deserve God's grace. They have hurt me. They've hurt my family. They've done this. They've done that. They've done something else. And they are not deserving of the grace of God. They're too big of a wretch. But I'm not. Better be careful of a Jonah attitude. Now look at verses 3 and 4. Therefore now, O Lord... Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? This is the second time, second time, and it's not the only time, but this is the second time that Jonah has basically said, I'd rather die than see your grace extended to these people. Jonah was so frustrated, he said, God, just take my life. I'm so angry. I've so, got so much pent-up anger in my life. Take my life. 
because you have extended grace to these people. Let me ask you a question. Is there a place to be angry about God and his grace? Verses 5 through 9. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to deliver for him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm. And so it damaged the plant that it withered. It so damaged the plant that it withered when the sun, and it happened when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. Third time, Jonah has said, I'd rather die. Just take my life. You talk about throwing around some words of your life carelessly, concern for your own life carelessly, concern, uh, lack of concern, lack of respect and honor for, as a creation of God, as a precious eternal soul, and yet Jonah wants to throw away the, throw around these threats. Oh, God, just take my life. God, just take my life. I'm so frustrated with you, God. Just take my life. I don't want to obey you, God. Let me be thrown into the sea and die rather than have to go down there and preach to those people. You better be careful. Jonah had selfish indignation. Here's my question. Notice what it said in verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city. Jonah wouldn't even stay in the city. You know what should have been happening when God relented and said, I'll not destroy Nineveh? When that revival came, when those thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, maybe millions of people were saved that day. Do you know what Jonah should have been doing? He should have been running up and down the streets of Nineveh, praising God, jumping up and down and shouting hallelujah, praise God. Look at here at all the people that have been saved today. But he's so angry, he went out on the side of the hill out east of town and he sat down so he could watch. The last verse, till he might see what would become of the city. I still can't believe that God is not going to destroy them. He builds him a little shelter. Jonah said, I'd rather die than see God's grace and mercy extended to these people. God said, you didn't, even, you didn't even have anything to do with that little plant. I caused that plant to grow up overnight and to give you shade, and I'm the one that caused it to wither to prove a point. You're so worked up over that plant that you're missing what's going on down here in Nineveh. And this is what we find out in verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you did not labor nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? All of those things being God's creation. When it says 120,000 people that couldn't distinguish between the right and left, that probably means very small children. So can you imagine a city large enough to have 120,000 very small children, innocent, precious children of that age, and that how many more adults, teenagers, that there were in that city of Nineveh and they all citywide came and they repented in sackcloth and ashes before God and Jonah is mad folks this is a day that God's ju uh, that uh, judgment and grace met and for this time grace won now about 150 years later Nineveh didn't stick in with their repentance you can read about it in the book of Nahum. The prophet Nahum spoke about them about uh, probably 100 years later. He wrote about them and God's frustration because they had gone back to their violent, evil ways and, and everything. And then they eventually were overthrown about 140, 150 years later after this. But for right now, God's grace overwhelmed the judgment. God provided grace upon grace upon grace for Jonah, and yet Jonah could not see past the hardness of his own heart to rejoice in what God had done for these souls.
Let me ask you a question today. Is your life filled with grace or is it filled with judgment? Which one's in your life? Is your life filled with obedience because of God's grace that is running rampant in your life? Yes, Lord, I will go where you'd have me to go, and I'll do what you would have me to do. Is your heart receptive to God's word to you, or are you stupefied and secured in your sin? Are you sitting here today, boy, preacher, I wish you'd hurry up and get done. I want to go home. I don't have any concern. I'm not giving my life to Jesus today. I want to tell you, that's a sad, sad place to be today.